molecular clocks. Today we're going to talk about how good are molecular clocks. Well, according to a recent paper in Science News, molecular clocks are too fast. And uh, the evidence for that is summarized in an article in Science News called Turn Back the Molecular molecular clocks, say Argentina's plant fossils. It's on the internet if you want to look at it, and it's um, relatively recent. That's December 2, 2014. And uh, the article begins, molecular clocks based on changes in genetic material indicate much younger ages for a wide variety of plants found as fossils in southern Argentina than do the solid geologic dates of those fossils, according to geoscientists who surveyed recent paleobotanical discoveries in Patagonia. Uh, now, of course, uh, I would ask a few questions about that, but uh, that gives you the perspective they're, uh, they're coming from. The findings suggest serious biases in molecular clocks, which are heavily used to date many kinds of living things. It also directly refutes a widely held idea about how most southern hemisphere plant and animal groups attained their current distributions. Geologists date fossils by radioisotopic analysis, which can produce absolute ages with uncertainties less than 0.05%. Well, at least that's the precision. Whether that's the accuracy is uh, open to question. Molecular clocks apply rates of molecular chains and fossil calibrations to the tree of life to construct a time tree that estimates when evolutionary events occurred. Substitution rates come from DNA found in multiple genes, and known dated fossils provide the calibration anchor points, known, of course, by standard theory. Uh, even though the clock's meth clock methods stated errors are much larger than for geologic dating, it offers the hugely appealing advantage of dating the large proportion of living organisms that have very limited or no fossil record. So even if they destroy it, they're still going to use it because they don't have anything else. Paleontology and molecular clocks have a long, uneasy relationship, said Peter Wilf a paleobotanist and professor of geoscience at Penn State. Now, stop and think about that. You have probably heard that the molecular data and the fossil data are all in accord and they all are united. Well, it sounds like maybe they're not quite in as much accord as people were saying. Paleo paleontologists want molecular clocks to work. However, for years, we have seen molecular dates, mostly for very deep evolutionary events, that are much older than the corresponding fossils. You may remember, uh, and we'll uh, come back to some of those from Darwin's doubt. This situation has been a frustrating catch-22 because if the clocks are wrong, no fossils exist that could demonstrate they are wrong. Why is that? Because you just say, well, the fossils happen somewhere else. That would have demonstrated that they're right. Here, we looked at many new plant fossils from the extremely productive region of Patagonia, and we found the opposite, that the fossils are much older than the clock dates. In this case, we can definitely see, say that the clocks are wrong. The fossils prove it. Again, remember, all we can really say is that they disagree and you are assuming that the fossils are the gold standard. Wilf Ignacio Escapa, National Scientific and Te Technical Research Council, Edigio Ferruglio Paleontology Museum, and if you're wondering why in the world that's MEF, where they get that from, it's a museum, Ediglio, uh, pardon me, Edigio, boy, I butchered that one, Ferruglio in Argentina, and many others have worked on Patagonian paleobotany together, based at Penn State, MEF, and Cornell University for more than a decade. 
We are dealing with one of the most recent controversies in biological sciences, said Escapa. By the way, this quote here wasn't in the original, but I thought it kind of belonged there. Is it possible to determine the tempo of evolution without an exhaustive analysis of the fossil record? Like, can we use molecular clocks to do it? The extremely diverse fossil record emerging from Patagonia seems to indicate that this is not currently possible. Oh. So the molecular clocks just don't agree with the standard geologic time scale. Wilf and Escapa looked at 19 fossil plant lineages of ferns, cycads, conifers, and flowering plants from Patagonia, Argentina, and compared their ages to molecular clock studies that used other fossils as calibrations, which sounds like the right way to do it. They reported their results today online in New Phytologist. They found that most of the fossil dates are significantly older than those determined by the molecular clock data, unless the previous calibration was already very closely related to the target fossil. In other words, you can't just apply this stuff blindly. You have to calibrate it. Sounds vaguely familiar, doesn't it? Anybody recall amino acid dating and how you have to calibrate the... Uh, yes, yes. Um, the work's further significant lies in the fact that all the fossils examined represent plants that lived on the supercontinent Gondwana in its terminal stage. Now, for those of you who have forgotten, Gondwana included South Africa, uh, pardon me, South America, Africa, India, um, Antarctica, and Australia. And most people put New Zealand up, uh, pardon me, New Guinea there. Some people put New Zealand down here. Uh, and some people put Iberia and, and uh, Central Europe interest. I think that includes Yugoslavia, among other things, uh, up on, uh, on this side. And, and also the Arabian Peninsula belongs right here. Um, and the idea was that they were all at one time all together, and then they split apart. And the evidence for that is that there are various fossils that are found in both or perhaps all five continents at once. Well, apparently this particular crocodilian is is found in. But see, if if the crocodiles, if if it were, let's say we found the same species, well, we would just extend it out to Australia. It's no problem. But the idea is that these are all found in the southern continents. They're not found in the northern continents, what was supposed to be Laurentia, which included much of Asia, and minus the Indian subcontinent, of course, and North America. We targeted our study towards one of the great, greatest debates in biology. What explains the disjunct distributions of so many plants and animal groups on different southern land masses separated by vast oceans, said Wilf. These land masses were once joined in Gondwana, and one famous school of thought, known as vicariance biogeography, holds that the modern distributions mostly result from the subsequent separations of the continents and the organisms that lived on them. On the other hand, molecular time trees increasingly place many evolutionary events after the final breakup of Gondwana, about 45 million years ago by the standard chronology. This explanation requires that many plant and animal groups evolved relatively recently, then somehow dispersed across the oceans. The vast accumulation of young molecular dates has convinced many researchers that this striking idea is correct. But these people disagree. However, what we see in these fossils is that Classic southern hemisphere plants, like the monkey puzzle trees that now inhabit South America and Australasia, lived on Gondwana long before it broke up, said Wilf. Transoceanic travel uh, is not required to explain their past and present distributions, and our results will reinvigorate, reinvigorate the vicariant school. However, we caution that dispersal across the oceans probably still played an important role, though diminished from what many thought, have thought recently. 
Gondwana was once composed of most of the land that is now in the southern hemisphere plus India. At its last stage, 45 million years ago, it still included Antarctica, South America, and Australia, Africa and India having presumably broken free by that time. The research's results showed that living plant groups found as fossils across the southern hemisphere evolved while there was still land connections or shallow water between these continents. In many cases, no long distance deep water crossings were necessary to achieve the distribution of the fossils' living relatives. Fossil plants from Patagonia are a superb resource for comparing geological and molecular dates. Not only do fossils have accurate geologic dates, but the taxonomic information on those fossils is well known because of their excellent preservation and completeness. There is now a large amount of new high quality information emerging from Patagonia that has not yet been assimilated into molecular dating studies, offering this rare opportunity to compare fossils and clocks for a relatively large number of plant groups. So basically they found a whole bunch of new fossils in Patagonia and they're correlating it with the, uh, the fossils uh, and correlating with the molecular clocks. The researchers are not certain why there is strong directional bias in these molecular clock dates. They suggest that some of the molecular clock studies omitted known fossils which would have made the dates older. They also suggest that the conventions for placing fossils on the tree of life as calibrations are too conservative and seem to bias molecular estimates significantly towards younger dates. The molecular clock says things happen more rapidly than we thought in the past. But we know that can't be right because Gondwana separated 45 million years ago. So some people have said, well, it just uh, spread across the ocean anyway. Although uh, the ocean all the way from South America to Australia is quite a stretch and not be found in between. The inaccuracy of the molecular clocks in this study raises new doubts about the accuracy of clock dates for many other organisms, from animals to human pathogens. I, I want you to note especially the human pathogens. We're going to have some fun. The work bolsters the importance of continuing to find new fossils of important plant and animal groups from the many undersampled regions of the world. However, even though the dialogue between paleontologists and molecular biologists is often difficult, you're wrong, no, you're wrong, the researchers agree that it must continue so that a broader understanding can emerge. But of course, the uh, standard time scale, and I think it's fair to call it the standard evolutionary time scale as well as geologic one in this case, uh, rules the roost. Discovery and description of new and exciting fossils together with real interdisciplinary efforts may be the single best opportunity to develop a clear consensus about this important issue in the evolution of life, said Escapa. And they're telling you the story source and so forth and um, uh, then they have a journal reference. So for fun we went and looked, at least I went and looked at the journal reference and um, uh, it is, in fact, online. The summary, which takes the place of an abstract, I'm going to give it in two pages because it's easier to read that way. Evolution and divergence age estimates derived from molecular clocks are frequently correlated with paleographic, paleoclimatic, and extinction events. One prominent hypothesis based on molecular data says, states that the dom dominant pattern of southern hemisphere biogeography is post gondwanan clay organ origins and subsequent dispersal across the oceans in a metaphoric green web. That's the theory that it, that it spreads without, uh, without having to have direct land connections. We tested this idea against well-dated Patagonian fossils of 19 plant lineages representing organisms, they left the space out after the comma, um, that actually lived on Gondwana. Most of these occurrences are substantially older than their respective, often post gondwanian molecular dates. The green web interpretation probably results from directional bias in molecular results. Gondwanan history remains fundamental to understanding southern hemisphere plant radiations and we urge significantly greater caution when using molecular dating to interpret the biological impacts of geologic events. They, uh, the molecular clocks are not only 
known to be inaccurate, but they're biased towards younger age. Continuing on, I'm just going to read certain parts of it that I found interesting. Um, the, the, you know, the article is a fairly long article. And it would take most of our time to read. Uh, evolutionary paleobiology is a principal driver and beneficiary of advances in geochronology. As paleontologists who frequently collaborate with geochronologists, we expect that molecular time trees will help fill gaps in the fossil record. However, we find molecular divergence age estimates, dates, difficult to evaluate, and not only because many of the results differ strikingly from the fossil data, molecular dates are extremely sensitive to placement of calibrating fossils as stem versus crown nodes. Note the importance of the calibrating fossils. Again, very similar to what you see with uh, amino acid dating. And to choices of methods and calibration scenarios. And there's that box one that they're talking about. And what they're saying is that you choose your fossils carefully because if you choose the stem node or the crown node incorrectly, you, you get a diff, you get a, an incorrect uh, uh, date. This here is presumably, if you just take this part here, is a crown node as well. Stem nodes just simply mean it passes on to something else but doesn't technically include it. Sort of like reptiles in, in current thought that have birds are actually supposed to be part of the reptile clan. We're part of the fish clan, by the way, eventually. Perhaps most significantly, molecular dates usually cannot be tested adequately with fossils. If molecular estimates are truly too old, they cannot be falsified because the required fossils never existed. If they are younger than comparable fossils, they are still not wrong because they represent minimum ages. We dispute this logic because dated fossils also represent minimal, uh, minimum ages of their lineages or clades. Arguments in support of molecular dating tend to emphasize the perceived similarities of results from different genes and models thus lacking any geological validation, or they present small sets of cl clock rock comparisons without any supporting stratigraphic discussion. Generations of scientists have developed the geologic time scale to its unprecedented current precision using several intensively cross-validated radioisotope systems in conjunction with a diverse suite of complementary techniques. Significant geochronology chronologic errors are extremely rare and mostly stem from uncritical use of obsolete stratigraphic data, not from modern procedures for grain selection, preparation, and analysis. Now, um, note that you may remember the bird tracks from uh, the Triassic. Those were dated by, carb by uh, potassium argon dating. And uh, and it agreed with the stratigraphic data. And it wasn't until they figured out that you couldn't have birds back that far that they redated it using lead lead dating. So, well, maybe they're not quite that rare. By contrast, the relatively new field of molecular dating does not yet have standards that define comparisons with the geologic time scale. The increasing number of molecular age estimates that are younger than the respective separation dates favors the hypothesis that post-Gondwanan oceanic dispersal of young lineages is the dominant mechanism that explains southern disjunctions. So what you had was you had, let's say, cowrie trees in South America, cowrie trees in Australia, nothing in between, presumably uh, well, of course, Antarctica isn't well, dis uh, well explored, so there might be some in Antarctica uh, in fossils, but, uh, but presumably they spread across a web, say, five million years ago. The problem with that theory is, is as these people will point out, is now we're finding cowrie tree fossils in Patagonia that are supposed to be 50 million years plus old, now, 
you have to correlate those two. And suddenly the, the hypothesis that, um, that they were spread across the ocean becomes a little bit harder to maintain when you realize that they're actually in those areas for longer than you expected. So maybe there's a problem with the, uh, with the molecular clock. Recently, Alan de Carroz made a detailed case for dispersal, metaphorically invo invoking the hypothesized trajectories of plants through time as a green web across the oceans. Before about 50 million years ago, the final separation of South America from Antarctica and on to Australia had not begun. Deep water barriers to biologic, uh, biotic interchange developed gradually over the next several million years. So they're saying really 45 million years is when, the, when it got big enough that it was really impossible to spread things. That would be, uh, what, Eocene? Starting to shade into Miocene. I think you've seen. Um, the fossils we discuss are recently studied remains of ferns, cycads, and conifers and angiosperms that lived on Gondwana, and the lineages they represent, by definition, evolved before Gondwana last separated. And I'm not going to go through the table, which is too big to cut and fit into a slide anyway, too many, but you can see the figure they have where there are a whole bunch of um, crown groups that are uh, 5, 10, 20 million years ago, supposedly, where the fossil evidence kind of suggests that they all happened well before 50 million years ago. Uh, with, uh, I guess, one exception here. And you can see there's, there are some estimates that are pretty good, but by and large, these are biased towards shorter ages um, than what uh, they're using as the gold standard, which is the uh, fossil evidence. Even without any consideration of molecular dates, the record from Patagonia convincingly demonstrates that Gondwanan history remains fundamental to the evolutionary radiations, distribution, survival, and conservation of southern hemisphere plants and plant associations. In other words, they were on Gondwana. It separated. They went their various ways. If our findings apply to a broader spectrum of organisms, there would be profound consequences for the general understanding of evolutionary rates. Notably, like Gondwanan plants, some molecular dates for important human pathogens are surprisingly young, and post-date fossil evidence. I'm going to have to look into that and bring back a report as to exactly what they're talking about because that's fascinating. Important human pathogens go back further in the fossil record than their molecular data. We're going to see some molecular data in just a little bit, and uh, I think it will be interesting to draw the uh, uh, reasonable conclusions from that. The conclusions of the paper are our results strongly suggest that the recent emphasis in the literature on post gondwanan dispersal, including the Green Web hypothesis, is partly based on mega biased clocks. That means they're way off. The inherently different large uncertainties of molecular dating do not comp compensate for the overall direction pattern of young bias across plant clades. You can believe that you know some of them were large, some of them were small, and you just say, well, you know, it kind of averages out, but they're saying, no, it doesn't average out. Even without any consideration of molecular dates, the record from Patagonia convincingly demonstrates that Gondwanan history remains fundamental to the evolutionary radiations, distributions, survival, and conservation of southern hemisphere plants and plant associations. If our findings apply to a broader, a broader spectrum of organisms, there will be profound consequences for the general understanding of evolutionary rates. Notably, like Gondwanan plants, some molecular da dates for important human pathogens are surprisingly young and post-date fossil evidence. We urge significantly greater caution when using molecular dates in the explicit context of geologic time and Earth history. The fossil record is always incomplete, but its exciting potential is only beginning to develop in many parts of the world. 
For future improvements in molecular dating seem very likely, but for now, fossils and geochronology provide the only rigorous, enduring temporal framework for evolutionary radiations. There is a conflict, and the, and the molecular data should be discarded when it disagrees with what they call the gold standard. Well, now that's claiming that the molecular clocks are too fast, but there's some evidence that molecular clocks are too slow. I'm going to read a few pages out of, uh, or a few paragraphs out of uh, Darwin's Doubt and omit some of it because um, it's faster to do that, but it, it organizes the data well. Uh, that's, of course, uh, the uh, book by Stephen Meyer in 2013, and this is from pages 1003 to, one, pardon me, 1003 to 109. Um, in the 1990s, evolutionary biologists uh, Gregory Way, Jeffrey Leventon, and Leah Shapiro performed a major study of the Cambrian relevant molecular sequence data. In 1996, they published their results in a paper entitled Molecular Evidence for Deep Precambrian Divergence Among the Metazoan Phyla. The Ray study concluded that the common ancestor of the animal forms lived 1.2 billion years ago, implying that the Cambrian animals took some 700 million years to evolve from this deep divergence point before first appearing in the fossil record. Now notice that that's relying on the molecular data and the fossil record doesn't show anything. So the fossils must have developed elsewhere where they didn't fossilize, I guess. Uh, even though we have sponge embryos from that area uh, that are clearly identifiable. So, More recently, Douglas Irwin and several colleagues performed a study comparing the degree of sequence difference between other genes, seven nuclear housekeeping genes, and three ribosomal RNA genes across 113 different species of living metazoa. The term metazoa refers to animals with differentiated tissue. They estimated that the last common ancestor of all living animals arose nearly 800 million years ago. Remember, the other one's 1.2 billion. This is 800 million. Um, to skip a few paragraphs, for example, comparing the Ray-led study and the Irwin-led study generates a difference of 400 million years. In the case of the other studies, even greater differences emerge. Many other studies have thrown their own widely varying numbers into the ring, placing the common ancestor of animals anywhere between 100 million. Wait a minute. 100 million, but we have fossils from 540 million, and 1.5 billion years before the Cambrian explosion. Some molecular clock studies, oddly, even place the common ancestor of the animals after the Cambrian explosion. How do you do that? Well, apparently that's what's being shown in Patagonia is that there are some that are way low, but there are also some that are way high. Sometimes contradictory divergence times are reported in the same article. The divergence between arthropods and vertebrates, insects and people, might be anywhere between 274 million and 1.6 billion years ago, the former date following all, falling almost 250 million years after the Cambrian explosion, when the ancestors are supposed to be there. Likewise, the uh, last common ancestor of protostomes or deuterostomes, two broadly different types of ca Cambrian animals, might have lived anywhere between 452 and 2 billion, 452 million and 2 billion years ago. 452 is still shy of the Cambrian explosion, 540 million years ago, but uh, two billion years ago is, you know, lots and lots of time, no fossils. One study in which the authors claimed to be 95% certain that their divergence date for certain animals groups fall within a 14.2 billion year range, more than three times the age of the Earth, and clearly a meaningless, meaningless result. Uh, Grauer and Martin some of you may remember Dan Grauer from other, uh, from other contexts, uh, wrote, a, wrote a paper in Trends in Genetics called uh, Reading the Entrails of Chickens, 
molecular time scales of evolution and the illusion of precision. Obviously, Grauer and Martin are not terribly impressed with the um, accuracy of the molecular clock. Unlike radiometric dating methods, molecular clocks depend on a host of contingent factors. As Valentine, Jablonski, and Irwin note, different genes in different clades evolve at different rates. Different parts of genes evolve at different rates, and most importantly, rates within clades, clades have changed with time. So great is this variation that one paper in the journal Molecular Biology and Evolution cautions the rate of molecular evolution can vary considerably among different organisms, challenging the concept of the molecular clock. But I thought they all agreed with each other. Apparently not. But, interestingly enough, there's evidence that molecular clocks are accurate. Um, Carter and Sanford wrote a paper in 2012, this is relatively new, in Theoretical Biology and Medical Modeling. And uh, here are some of the graphs that come from the paper. This is influenza virus from early 2009 to early 2010. And notice that as they're getting specimens, there's a pretty close uh, correlation between time and the number of mutations. But that's not all. And another paper, uh, another graph in the same paper where that, what you just saw, all goes to the area that's circled. You'll notice that you have a very linear uh, progression and that if uh, and remember that this is a lot more data than just what you can see there. And that uh, if you look at this, there's a second line <coughs> that comes down below. This apparently came from a refrigerator that had preserved influenza virus for 21 years and was accidentally liberated. So that's what happened to, to this lineage, which, by the way, has now died out. H1N1 flu is practically extinct in humans. Um, if you take this data and you move it 21 years forward, and it doesn't really matter, 22, 23, <coughs> 19, uh, will give you uh, very close to the same kinds of data. You will notice that the total mutations form a line that is so close that the R squared is 98 percent of the variance is accounted for by time. That is really tight variance. The non-synonymous ones are still pretty much in line, and there the variance is almost as good. Um, the correlation of variance is almost as good, 94 percent. Now, that suggests that the clock is, in fact, accurate when we test it. Now, if we start out by assuming that standard geology is accurate, well, you have to come to the conclusion that molecular clocks are not very good. Now, if we start out with the assumption that the more recent data are accurate, it suggests, one, that common descent maybe shouldn't be assumed. And that's why the molecular clocks are so far off, is because they're not from related organisms, in fact. And it suggests also that standard geology is insecure, that perhaps uh, the time scale needs to be moved up considerably. But I'm going to suggest that we don't stop there. We may be even more positive about what's going on. Let me uh, give you one example, and then I'll throw out some other ones. Uh, remember mitochondrial leave. According to a paper in Nature, all women today are matrilinearly de descended from one woman who lived 200,000 years ago. Well actually somewhere between 140,000 and 290,000. Um, if you 
multiply those two and take the square root, uh, it's 201,500 years more or less. That's why the 200,000 years ago is probably reasonable. Uh, Parsons, on the other hand, there's another paper, and this one is in Nature Genetics, and I didn't put that down. Uh, somehow that got omitted from the, uh, uh, from the slide, but it's Nature Genetics. It's uh, a high observed substitution rate in the human mitochondrial DNA control region, and it's uh, coming down uh, to uh, where the results are listed and, and reported on and commented on. The observed substitution rate reported here is very high compared to rates inferred from evolutionary studies. A wide range of CR substitution rates have been derived from phylogenetic studies spanning roughly 0.025 to 0.26, so a tenfold difference of uh, sites per site per million years, including the confidence intervals. A study yielding one of the faster estimates gave the substitution rate of the CR hypervariable regions as 0.118 plus or minus 0.031 sites per million year, which is a you know pretty accurate, uh, or I should say pretty precise measurement. Assuming a generation time of 20 years, this corresponds to about one per 600 generations in an age of the mitochondrial DNA um, uh, most recent common ancestor of about 133,000 years instead of 200,000 years. So this is one of the faster ones. Thus our observation of the substitution rate 2.5 per site per uh, and I, I think that's per million years, and unfortunately I didn't reduce it, um, is roughly 20-fold higher than would be predicted from phylogenetic analysis. Let's see their rate again um, was 0 0.118, and we're looking at 2.5. Yeah, so it's about 20-fold 20, 20 higher. Using our empirical rate to calibrate the mitochondrial DNA molecular clock would result in an age of the mitochondrial DNA most recent common ancestor of about 6,500 years ago. Clearly un incompatible with the known age of modern humans. Well, that all depends on which theory you, you have, doesn't it? Um, even acknowledging that the most recent common ancestor of mitochondrial DNA may be younger than the most recent common ancestor of modern humans, it remains impossible to explain the known geographic distribution of mitochondrial DNA sequence variation by human migration that occurred only in the last 6,500 years. Mm -hmm. I have heard of theories that suggested that as a reasonable figure. Um, while, our, uh, while our results are at, odd with at odds with those of phylogenetic studies, they are in excellent agreement with a recent report that also directly measured the CR substitution rate. That study compared CR and protein coding sequences from multiple individuals within a single mitochondrial DNA lineage that carries a Lieber hereditary optic neuropathy mutation. So this is uh, pathological uh, variation. Assuming no reversion mutations, a total of 81 generational events were surveyed and two CR mutations were observed, which is about one in 40 generations. Remember the other one was assumed to be a one in 600 more or less? In that case, multiple clones of PCR amplified DNA were sequenced and then mutations were detected within low level heteroplasmic mixtures. However, at least one individual was virtually fixed for each mutation, so the same rate would have been obtained using our approach of directly sequencing the PCR product. Our results extend the observation of an unexpectedly high substitution rate to multiple independent lineages, indicating that the high rate is a general characteristic of mitochondrial DNA evolution and not an artifact of a single image that carries a pathogenic mitochondrial mutation. So, yeah. 
they're, they're getting the same results consistently. What could account for the disparity between the observed substitution rate and those derived from phylogenetic analyses? Hmm. Well, from the abstract, uh, we'll quote, this disparity cannot, which is the same disparity where they're talking about, cannot be accounted for by simply, for simply by substitutions at mutational hotspots, suggesting additional factors that pro produce any discrepancy between the very near term and long-term apparent rates of sequence divergence. Now, I look at all this data and I say from an evolutionary perspective, molecular clocks were initially felt to be potentially very helpful in determining evolutionary history and to be supportive evidence for the standard geologic time scale. But with time, it has become apparent that molecular clocks do not match the standard time scale and if one assumes the standard time scale, they must be commonly in error, sometimes too much, sometimes too little. From this perspective, it is not clear how we should view the apparent accuracy of recent molecular clocks. If the molecular clocks are so bad in evolutionary history, then why are they so good when we look at the flu virus? From a short age perspective, the recent data may be viewed as reasonably accurate. And we just take them, uh, and then we take that and look at the other data, and it implies that some ages, such as that of mitochondrial Eve, are overestimated in the standard literature. And that really a time frame that's very compatible with a standard <laughs> biblical model uh, would fit. The youth of some molecular clock ages could imply that standard geologic ages and therefore radiometric dating ages are overestimated. Which means that maybe the gold standard isn't as good as we thought it was. This raises the question of whether further studies on other animals might be able to distinguish between evolved variants and created design. Let me say, give you an example. Are bonobos and chimpanzees evolved from one original ape? Instinctively, I would say yes. They look very similar except for their behavioral characteristics. And in that case, it would be interesting to see whether the differences between bonobo and chimpanzee DNA are compatible with uh, four, five thousand, six thousand years of divergence. And if so, we have just made uh, a reasonable prediction from standard data. What about chimpanzees and gorillas? Are they originally one created kind or are they actually two different created kinds? One could presumably use molecular clocks to, to ask the question, if you go back five or 10,000 years, are they still distinct? If so, you might raise the question of whether maybe they're different created kinds. What about ground squirrels? I know that's one of uh, Leonard Brand's favorite uh, uh, things to look at. Uh, what about meadow mice, voles? Uh, perhaps we could start putting uh, baromenology on a more precise footing and more accurate footing by starting to use molecular clocks to see whether it's reasonable to assume that they diverged during the time frame that's available. In fact, if the clock is that good, we might even be able to give an approximate date for the flood if we have molecular clocks converging on one answer. I think this is very interesting research that could be done from a creationist standpoint. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. How much money would it take to do this? Uh, you, you, you're getting more and more sequences out there on the literature all the time and can't uh, just I, a, a little bit of calculation do it? 
actually. Uh, you might be able to address that to um, Susan, uh, uh, I'm blocking in her last name now, the, uh, the new chair, chairman of the, uh, uh, of the biology department. What's Susie Phillips? Phillips, yeah. Uh, Suzanne Phillips, I believe, has told me that they're planning to do a bunch of sequencing for the university. They're starting up something. I suggested to her that we look at uh, chimp and chimp and uh, and bonobo Y chromosome data, mm -hmm. which I think would be fascinating. But it looks like it might be interesting to see what mitochondrial data uh, shows as well. Um, you know, if 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 the differences and you use today's rates of mutation, project back to say 5,000 years, that would be interesting to say the least. And if we consistently find that with let's say mice, with rabbits, with uh, various other mm -hmm. creatures, and then we find larger gaps between them then it might very well uh, be, we might be able to figure tell, out tell exactly what are the original created kinds. Well, you might be able to at least tell exactly which animals happen to be on the ark. Yeah. I think it'd be interesting. And uh, how much would it, once you have the sequence, it's just a matter of computation. Right? My impression is that you can get a that you can get a sequence. Uh, you know, a, a targeted sequence. I think you can actually get for uh, under a hundred dollars. I I've seen quotes of fifteen for certain particular biomarkers. I'm sure that's a volume based relationship, but. Uh, but you know, if you had mitochondrial DNA and you wanted to run it, I, I, I would think that this would be the kind of project that, that um, somebody who was you know, feeling philanthropic could easily uh, help to get done. What could you use as controls here to, to strengthen the argument? Well, you could, you could, for example, compare mice with each other, and then you could compare mice with rats, and then you could pick, you know, compare them all with muskrats and, and, and so forth and see what kind of data you get. And uh, you know, if it's the kind of thing, remember that the mutation rate has been underestimated by the evolutionary ge uh, uh, geologists uh, by around 20-fold in the case of humans. In other words, they're comparing how many cha changes do you need between chimpanzees and humans if the chimpanzees are five million years old. And, uh, you know, when you take that rate and you just assume that's what you get, well, you get, um, you get the answers that you're looking for. Um, in if you take actual humans compared with each other, the rates are about 20-fold higher. And so we can expect that the same is probably true for, let's say, mice and rats. And the various kinds of mice might, you might very well find out that there were two different kinds of mice or five different kinds of mice and that's it. And then you, and you can put them all within the last, say, 5,000 or 7,000 or whatever the number happens to be, 4,300 years. And you'd want to compare that with groups that aren't closely related to see what the contrast is. Exactly. And if you find vast gaps between the other ones, then uh, it suggests that you've, you've hit on a pair that, you know, you've hit on which animals were in the ark to begin with. That it took three different mice families, for example, to get all the, or maybe one. Maybe 
It took a mice family and a lemming family and a vole family. You know, I mean, I, I, I can't say without looking at the data, but it would be, uh, I think that looking at the data might be very interesting. How long is the sequence in D mitochondrial DNA? Oh, I would have to look to see. I, I have forgotten. It depends on what you want. Uh, if you're getting the CR area, it would probably be shorter than the whole D mitochondrial DNA, so you, you know, would find it easier to do. Looks like a great project. It, hello? It would be interesting to compare, say, uh, rabbits and um, sheep, or cattle and uh, deer. Uh, do, you, do you follow what I'm saying? Um, why? Because according to the, the biblical record, of the clean animals, there were uh, how many preserved on the ark? It depends on uh, how you read that. It's either seven or seven pair. Okay. Either way, it's it's quite a bit more than uh, the converse. So you might have more trouble tracing the deer back to one group than well, you did the, uh, uh, let's say, the rabbits. You would see that the bottleneck would not be as extreme at that stage uh, by comparing the two lineages. That is true. Um, but what would be interesting is that you would have essentially a way of seeing the same theme uh, reproduced over and over and over, either one way or the other. And you might, you might find out that there are actually deer and antelope and pronghorn that all three went in separately. Or maybe there's several different kinds of antelope that, 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 that don't go. Uh, you can't get them in 5,000 years or 10,000 years right. or whatever yeah. the number happens to be. That yeah, you, you, you may find that all cats uh, originated from one pair or perhaps several. Yeah, it's, you, it's may, you might find out that the big cats came in by themselves and the little cats came in by themselves. Yeah. It, it would be very interesting to, to look at that. And I don't know that anybody's actually done that. Well, not yet. But, uh, but it would be fun but, to do. But the way these things are going, it seems to me that pretty soon we will have um, the, the digital information of all of those genomes anyhow. And all that will be necessary is for somebody to apply some computing power to the information. That you might be able to just take um, Ocelot right off, the sh uh, uh, right off the computer shelf. Right. And compare it with lion and compare it with tiger and compare it with... Yes, domestic cat. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a fascinating issue. It, 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 we're getting to the stage where getting the information is not um, the rate limiting step as much as being able to use the information you have. Um, you, you know, like uh, when the um, Boston bombers did their thing, the problem was not uh, finding sources of information that could be useful. It is finding the information you need from all of the information you got. Because there was such an overwhelming amount of information, you now have to have some means of finding what you're looking for. You have to sift the information. You have to sift the information in order to get an answer to a particular question. And in that, it helps to have the clear outlines of the question to begin with. Yes, you have to have a very clear question. No question, no amount of data will help you. Uh, 
I would just raise, raise the question, you know, nature always turns out, at least whenever I have looked into nature, it turns out to be more complicated than I thought it was. And uh, I, I would say you uh, need to check, uh, for instance, we could introduce the question of mutational hotspots here. Mm -hmm. How consistent are they? Uh, do you apply them all the time? Do you not? And so on. Uh, uh, are our controls taking care of that? And so on. The, the thing is, I don't think it can, that it, it may not be as simple as, as it looks, but it really looks good here. Well, you know, I'm looking at the flu data and I say, you can't just trash this stuff. That's too good. The, the trashing of it willingly in, in service to the standard geologic time scale, I think is methodologically not, not a good way of do, going. I think that what it's saying is that there are differences, but I'm not sure there are differences that are due to lineage, that they may very well be differences that are due to design. And the, the beauty of doing it this way is that we have now taken creationism and used it to produce hypotheses that will produce research, either laboratory or computer, or perhaps even uh, doing you know, basic bench research of our own, um, that turns creationism into a science. Now, if creationism <coughs> continually fails in its predictions, uh, and we have to keep redoing and keep redoing and, and uh, not getting the right answers, mm -hmm. then I think that um, you could say it turns into poor science. But it's not non-science. And I don't think anybody can really make that argument well. If you start saying, well, because of our theory, you should find this mm -hmm. in the laboratory, and we go into the laboratory, and we find it. You know, I mean, that's, that's one of the beauties of, of, uh, of the DNA in dinosaurs th uh, thing, uh, the, or, uh, pardon me, the uh, soft tissue in dinosaurs thing. That's one of the beauties of, of uh, going up to uh, Canada to get eocene material from permafrost. Uh, you know, we start saying, well, it's not been uh, 45 million years, it's only been um, it's only been 6,000 years and it's been frozen the whole time, or frozen most of that time. And so I think that at that point we start, we start making uh, creationism into actual science when it starts predicting stuff and you can actually test it. Uh, yeah. Now that's two-edged sword, but uh, you know, if we always <laughs> say, well, but maybe we'll be wrong, we'll never do any studies. And if we were right, we'll never find out. Uh, I, w I would just uh, comment on uh, uh, turning creation into science. Uh, is um, evolution science? It's just, a, it's just a matter of definition here. In that case, I'd, I'd say you'd say also evolution is a science. It's hypothesizing about data. Uh, and so you could say, uh, but I think creation has been in a science game for a long time. Yeah? Uh, and not with respect to this, but uh, uh, it, uh, at least if you, if you define science as, you know, uh, study of nature and stay within that realm. Uh, we can't exclude hypotheses and uh, there's so much data that's against evolution in science that uh, uh, I think we've got rather, uh, I'd say, a comprehensive view of science that would include creation anyway. Uh, and it's been there for a while. Yeah. Uh, the, the simplest definition I can think of of science is science is the study 
of the reproducible. Because it's reproducible, it can be tested. Oh, but this is going to, your, your cosmology is going to have a trouble here. Well, <laughs> then maybe cosmology is on the fringes of science to the point that cosmologists can say, if you look here, you'll find this. If you look here, you'll find it, that. And they look there and they find it. Then it does become science. Because what it says is that it's reproducible and it's understandable as to why it's reproducible, which is one step up from just simply reproducible. Yeah, well, I think the, I like to think of science as being a little beyond uh, just the reproducible, uh, in that we can, uh, based on what we observe now, uh, reason of what might have occurred in the past, even though we can't reproduce it. But it, but it's helpful to be able to say, and with this theory, we should find this. I mean, for example, the idea that Gondwana was once together. There are several lines of evidence. One of them is South America and Africa fit together. Okay. And the other continents or subcontinents that are there kind of sort of fit together as well. Uh, but when you take that and you start saying, and that means that certain animals that lived in during a certain t period of time could be distributed on Gondwana, but not Laurasia. And so they'll be found in South America and Africa, or they'll be found in South America and Australia, which is, you know, kind of weird if you think about it. How do you get animals from South America to Australia and nowhere else in between? Uh, except for maybe uh, uh, Antarctica, which you can't explore. And of course, which they would have subsequently died from because it's too cold. So, yeah, you're looking at that, and, and you start seeing correlations like that, and it starts to say, maybe your theory is correct. And then you look at mountain ranges, and like, for example, there's one in Africa that happens to match one in the Uruguay-Paraguay region in South, Af uh, South America. And now you're starting to say, boy, this really looks like an interesting hypothesis. Um, and I happen to think that, that there's probably some truth to that. So uh, now, you know, whether the time frame is the same is a whole different question. Uh, but I think that there's, there's some pretty decent evidence that Gondwana actually existed, probably during the mid to late stages of the flood. And that Part of the reason why the fossils are spread across there is because it's easier to spread them in contiguous regions than it is to spread them all the way around the world. So, yeah, I, it, it makes sense. Um, and even though we can't go back to videos of Gondwana land, the fact that you have that postulate that makes certain kinds of general predictions that turn out to be correct uh, kind of adds weight to the idea that, that that's what happened in the past. Well, I think that in the same way, if creation really happened, then we have rapid divergence from, uh, uh, from a few animals in the ark. And you should be able to go through. And in fact, what would be interesting is to see whether that same divergence can be seen for plants, because I rather suspect it can't. Um, because the plant's survival was more haphazard than those, that of the animals. And be worth looking at. So Paul. How many um, animals and, and plants and stuff would it then actually take to be on the ark to get where we're at nowadays? So, you know, if we have all kinds of whole bunch of different types of animals and plants and everything now, it seems like that's so much to, to fit on the one little tiny ark. So how do you, you know, that would be an interesting thing to see how dense or how little you could actually have on the ark to actually get to where we're at? Yeah, it is an interesting question. Now, to be fair, 
uh, many of those animals are very small. And so, you know, if you had 20 pairs of rats rather than one, you wouldn't really notice it that much. Uh, uh, but also to be fair, uh, there is, there has been for some time a hypothesis that most of the time the division is at the genus level, mm -hmm. uh, pardon me, at the family level, that in terms of uh, humans it's probably at the genus level, but that may very well be because uh, the family level has been artificially lowered there. Um, and if that's the case, and this is just a rough estimate, then you're looking at, I think, about 2,000 families, if I remember correctly, of mammals and birds, or maybe... Uh, yeah, but of course you, you may want, you don't want, you want to leave off the insects probably, but that's, I don't know. Uh, there is one study, just related a little bit to what you're saying, that suggests maybe there were uh, 1,600 different organisms on the ark. That's just... Uh, so that's, yeah, 2,000 would be a reasonable estimate then. Give or take. Give or take. And, um, and so if you had 2,000 organisms, I'm sorry, so you have sorry. a boat... I, I, think I'm, I think I misspoke. I think it's 16,000. Sorry, 16,000 different species. And that would take up one third of the space in the ark. The ark was a huge boat. There's no question about that. I mean. Yeah, but I'm 16,000 organisms. Uh, that's, that's a lot, but. Well, there's a lot of organisms. You realize most of them are very small. We're, right. we're, we're big. So, how many total? species do we have now identified? I mean, well, what's the <laughs> expansion uh, from 16,000 I mean, to what? <laughs> the, the figures are wild out there. Uh, you know, we get a couple million identified species not in the literature. How many of those are real species is a big question. And this is especially true in the fossil record. Um, well, you don't have, you know, uh, Less than, less than a million different kind of fossils in the fo identified in the fossil record type of thing. Are they real species or not? Keep in mind there's a strong tendency on the part of a taxon or a biologist to find a new species. And if he finds a new extra hair on a, a fly, he may be tempted to call it a new species type of thing and publish a paper on it. Well, especially if you can name it after yourself, or at the very well, least, get your name attached as the well, person who first described it. You made your you made your self in history. Taxonom procedure does that. The person who discovers it puts his name after it in the original description. Uh, so uh, there are probably a lot more species there than we think. Furthermore. Uh, on the other side, I think there's a lot more biological flexibility and variability than we have thought there was before. Organisms, I think, were built with uh, mechanisms for adaptation and adjustments to environments. Because I think, you know, and it seems like in our modern mind, our modern ways now, you know, so many people probably think back and arc and all this stuff, it, you know, it feels like that fairy tale type thing and if you can show that that really isn't necessarily a fairy tale everything fits and, and can actually you know represent what we see in our modern world back to that ancient thing it debunks you know some of that reluctance mm -hmm. of people to believe in this well let's supposing that we were to start showing that of the animals that are extant now uh, let's say 15,000 different original pairs could account for all the animals that we have, uh, uh, mammals, birds, and reptiles, which are, seem to be the ones that go into the ark. Um, maybe amphibians, I don't know. Uh, then at that point you can start uh, making some kind of uh, uh, comment that, that 
the estimate that was being made by, I think it's Wood, Wood Merapi that yeah, actually did the work. Wood, Wood um, that, uh, that the estimate isn't that far off. And it would start mm -hmm. suggesting that uh, if it's only 5,000 years, that, that really starts you know, pushing us into a 5,000 year old flood. And what would be even more interesting is that if the, let's say the plants dated out to around 8,000 years, uh, then we would have an even more interesting thing where, where the plants converge on a, a creation because multiple specimens made it through the flood and the animals converge on the flood because only one pair made it through. Yeah. The, uh, the suggestion that uh, the problem of the fairy tale is real. I mean, I, this, you know, uh, it's so out of character of what's going on on the earth that I at present, you know, people say, hey, how could this be, this be a worldwide flood and so on. But uh, when you go out there and look at those rocks, you see how tremendously widespread they are. I mean, it, uh, and you look at parts where parts are missing, there's no erosion between, it's been rapidly deposited and so on. Uh, and then you look at sheets and sheets of conglomerate, which, you know, incredible means that it has to be all mixed up pretty much and then dumped out. I mean, Chenerbe conglomerate, for instance, you know, 100,000 square miles of a conglomerate, it's a coarse sand in places and so on, uh, spread in one thin layer all over the place. I mean, it, uh, the fairy tale becomes pretty realistic. Yeah, well, that's that's the thing. We, there is so much of this evidence, but people we haven't been pointing it out to people, and, and people haven't, you know, gotten a grasp mm -hmm. on that. And people believing what they've been told about all this evolution, and so just showing that mm -hmm. the whole evolutionary sort of change from what you could get from the ark to here could occur in this short time span and that what has been purported to be this evolution for millions of years could actually just be, you know, misrepresent or misinterpretation of this shorter time span change from, you know, species could make a big difference, I think, in people's minds oh, and yeah. understanding and acceptance. And I'll tell you what the fun <coughs> part will be is when we start saying, and you should find this, and then we go to the computer and find three different cat and uh, lo and behold, it does merge to about 5,000 years ago. And then we go out and test our own cats, you know, and get ocelots from South America and get, uh, you know, the, some of the African cats. And they look like they're, they have the same phenomena. At that point, you start saying, this looks real. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I think that those kinds of things will change at least some people's minds. I don't know if it will change everybody's because I think there's some people that are holding it for what I would call non-scientific reasons. Uh, but I think that if, if we start <laughs> being able to nail data pieces at a time, you know, whole groups at a time, and if you go here, you'll find this, and if you go here, you'll find this, and we find it, I think at that point, um, creation starts looking much more attractive. Yeah, exactly. And it, I mean, it seems to me like, I mean, you know, you keep seeing these studies, broad surveys of the public and X number, I don't know, however many percent, keep refusing to believe in, in the evolution, but they don't have the, the more scientific backing for that. And so they keep being told by the evolution side that, no, you're just not scientific and, and you're just believing in all this fairy tale stuff. We're the scientists and, and you have to believe this because we're telling you this is what we, we find, you know, but the public just can't accept it. But if they had, you know, a lot more backing on, on the other side, you know, it would make such a big difference in, uh, you know, people's belief systems. Um, there were several hundred papers documenting the harmfulness of smoking to our health when the seven corporate 
executives swore before Congress that they knew of no such evidence. Isn't it interesting that at the very time when the evidence against smoking as a form of harmless mm, recreation has never been stronger, yet this is the very time when there is the greatest push to now legalize pot. So while the cigarette smoking is on its way down, now the pot usage is on the way up. Do you suppose that maybe the cigarette companies are thinking once the pot trade is legal, they could just become pot producers and retailers with no problem? And then they're, they're protected for another 20 years until people find out that pot also causes lung cancer. Well, <laughs> you know, the research seems to find, uh, have, have a little lag time to catch up. But how is smoking one weed any better than smoking another weed? You know. Well, except for the active drug, I agree with you. And I, I think that it's only a matter of time before pot's going to turn out to be causing lung cancer as well. But, you know. But the electronic cigarettes now are taking over, and, and people are getting addicted to the nicotine. Oh, sure. Well, the, 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 the nicotine itself, uh, you know, people don't realize that two thirds of the deaths from smoking are actually um, heart disease related. And that happens to be due to the nicotine and not to the not to the uh, carcinogen. So, you know, you don't win by switching to e-cigarettes. But, you know, that's that's a, maybe a different story for a, a different day. And um, maybe one of these days we should uh, we should see how much literature is on there, and uh, and uh, bring it to attention. That does that is a science religion. Uh, interface sure. problems. So. It has great impact on people's welfare. Yeah. So anyway, come back next week. We'll have some more fun with other th studies that have been left behind. Uh, and hopefully some of them will be as interesting as this one.